All righty, welcome to RAP Lecture 7. Today is packet synchronization. <clears throat> Excuse me. So before we get into everything, um, there is a poll that went out a few weeks ago. And as you can see, our the number of respondents is very large at three. And by popular demand, this is what we're going to cover in the remainder of the quarter. So we have two votes for OFDM. We have two votes for PLLs and two votes for antennas. So by majority rule, that's uh, those are the top three topics we're going to cover. Um, and if there's time, we can go through the rest of the stuff. I think uh, it's sad that nobody picked VCOs. That's a fun topic, but oh well. <laughs> <laughs> so today, um, <laughs> this, this outline doesn't make much sense unless it's right after the title slide. But first is the problem, the problem being packet synchronization. Um, and then, then we have the solution to the problem, which is adding preambles and using cross correlations. Uh, to detect packets, and that, that's what the third bullet point is saying. So essentially we're doing cross correlations to detect packets and synchronize the receiver with the transmitter. So first, just to recap what we did in the past, uh, last lecture we talked about um, some estimation methods, specifically carrier frequency estimation, um, so that's, you know, the transmitter has a frequency uh, that it's transmitting at, and the receiver has it has a, you know, its own oscillator that may be slightly offset in frequency from the transmitter. And as a result, when you try to demodulate some uh, symbols, they won't, the, your, your, essentially your entire constellation diagram will start rotating as a, a like the speed of that rotation will be proportional to the frequency offset. Then it's phase offset, which just gives you a constant uh, rotation to the constellation diagram. And we also talked about re-raise cosine filtering and uh, you know, using FIR filters to do that. So we'll do, a, do one more synchronization thing, and that is your transmitter is sending symbols, right? And the receiver is receiving symbols. But suppose you have like a, a communication system where you have a series of bits um, that you want to send and you send them and then you wait, you know, a few more seconds for another series of bits to send and you send them again. Um, you, you're essentially sending bursts of information, not a continuous stream of information. And so that's kind of similar to how UART works, like on a microcontroller. You know, uh, data is sent in packets. I think the packets are, what is it, nine bits long or something? Eight? I forget. There's a parity bit in there somewhere. But in any case, um, the data is not sent as a continuous stream. And so that means that the receiver needs to know when, when each packet of data starts and ends in order to properly uh, decipher uh, the data. and know when to start deciphering data. So knowing when the packets end is easy if the packets are of a fixed length. So assuming you know where the packet starts, you can easily determine when it ends based on how long you expect the packet to be. And that's not always the case. Um, you know, For example, you might have variable length packets uh, the length depends on how much information you're sending or something like that, in which case uh, you might uh, encode the length of the packet in the beginning of the packet so that the receiver knows how long it is. Um, knowing when the packet starts is a little more difficult, right? Because your receiver might be continuously listening for data and um, it doesn't offhand know when the data starts. Uh, you, like, for example, you might check when uh, you see, you know, uh, 
something go from high to low or low to high, that's a lot easier in a you know baseband sense when you have like you're communicating over a wire, for example. But on a wireless communication system, you're multiplying what you receive by a cosine or a sine, and you get an I and Q channel, for example, and the uh, there might be some phase shift between the two. So what your transmitter might be sending is not exactly what you're receiving. And so if you wanted to do that, you'd have to correct for you know, the frequency offset, the phase offset, and all of that before you are able to properly detect things. So what can we do? Well, before that, uh, here's kind of a problem or what it kind of looks like. So if you have a high SNR, no ISI and blah, 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 everything's perfect, then things are a little easier. But that's never the case. So here I'm, I'm getting rid of the relatively high SNR condition. Let me bring up the pointer thing. Um, the relatively high SNR case. And so what I'm plotting here is just, um, I, nothing's being sent for a little while until time one here. Then a burst of information is sent. And you can't see individual symbols here, but there are indeed individual symbols. And then there is nothing after that. And I mean, it doesn't look like nothing, but of course that's noise. So you can imagine if the noise was large enough such that it was kind of near the level of the signal, it'd be very hard to discern when you're getting a signal or when you're just getting noise. So that's not good. Um, so how do we solve this problem, right? So what we can do is if we insert a known symbol sequence into the beginning of the packet and the known sequence doesn't actually contain useful information, but rather it helps us discern when a packet starts. And you can also use it for um, you know, frequency and phase estimation and some other estimations, but we're just using it for packet detection for now. Um, so we, if we do that and we detect that sequence, um, in the presence of noise, then we know exactly when a packet starts. And from then we can, then on, we can do all the other methods we talked about and uh, demodulate our symbols or detect our symbols. So the question is, how do we choose a symbol sequence and how do we detect the sequence in the first place? And so that's where, at least the answer to the second question, that's where the cross-correlation comes in. So if you don't know, cross-correlation is essentially a convolution, except there's a, some differences. Um, you know, if you look at the bottom left here, this is the equation for a, a cross-correlation between the functions f and g as a function of tau. Tau is basically the, uh, I mean, you can think of it just like a convolution as a function of time, it's the same thing. Um, but here tau, tau can be thought of as the delay between one function with respect to another. But what we're doing is if you look here, we have f of t, you can ignore the bar at the top for now, times g of t plus tau dt. And remember in a convolution, you had f of t times g of uh, t minus tau, and there's no bar. So, you know, they're pretty similar, just one's a plus and one's a minus. Um, what, and the, you know, this diagram here is showing the differences. So remember with convolution, you flip and drag one signal over another. With cor cross correlation, you don't do the flipping, but you still do the dragging. So what you do is you, like if we were cross correlating F with G, uh, what you're doing is essentially, um, taking G and you're moving it to the start of F. So I mean, here's, here's the picture, right? So we take F, uh, sorry, we take G, which is the red guy. We move it to the start of F and then we just slide it along. Um, and, and you know, for every time delay, we multiply the two functions, take the sum and that's the output, right? So same idea as convolution. 
And when you do that, you kind of, you get exactly what the convolution looks like, or you might get the flipped version of it, depending on the order of f and g. Um, Cause see, it's not commutative here, unlike the convolution, but you know, pretty, pretty straightforward, I hope. Now, the reason why there's a bar there, right? That's the conjugate, complex conjugate. So this only matters if you have complex signals, which we do, um, but it's not gonna play a huge role in understanding how it works. Um, I'll also mention there's the autocorrelation, which is basically the cross correlation between two functions that are the same. So here we have the cross correlation of F and F, which is the autocorrelation of F and similarly for G, um, but we're not gonna be using that. So, so far, so good? So far, so good. Okay. So here, here's just a simple example of that. Um, I have two uh, BPSK sequences, right? So it's either one or minus one. And I just, you know, I punched in random numbers here. Uh, and then we're cross-correlating this sequence here with this sequence. So it's one minus one minus one. And so similar to a convolution, you kind of get a maximum when the two functions line up, um, you know, like with like. And you can see that here, we get a maximum at this position six. And so let's see why that is. So if we uh, took this, this function or this sequence here to the beginning of this sequence, we would have this minus one at position three multiplied with this one, which uh, will get us minus one, right? Um, and that, that's this minus one right here. But then we slide this over by one position and so we have this minus one times this minus one and this minus one times this one. Uh, you add the two and you get, uh, uh, you should get zero, I have two here. Hold on. <laughs> one, Interesting. Um, I may, may have made a mistake in the computing this, but the point here <laughs> is that when um, this function or the, this sequence is lying on top of the corresponding sequence here, which is this one minus one and minus one, which is at position six, we get a maximum right here at position six. So that, that's what we want. And of course you get non-zero values elsewhere. And so it's kind of up to you to design these two sequences such that you get a maximum at one particular point and something close to zero elsewhere. If you want good um, you know, temporal localization of uh, one particular sequence. So hopefully that makes sense, despite my little trip up there. Um, right, so essentially what the cross correlation is doing is you take a known sequence, you cross correlate it with something else. And when the known sequence lies, lines up with the known sequence, you get a maximum. Elsewhere, you don't get a maximum. So, the tricky part, of course, is designing the appropriate bit sequence in order to get this property to work out nicely. Um, so there's uh, you know, a number of ways of doing this. And I just pulled one bit sequence here that happens to work out nicely. And we can take a look at this. So it looks kind of random, right? 
but this, this sequence here has a nice property. It's 15 symbols long or 15 numbers long. But if you were to repeat the sequence infinitely um, and then cross correlated that infinite sequence with just a single iteration of it, then what you'd find is that whenever the, the, this sequence lines up with one of the infinite repetitions, you'll get a peak and everywhere else you'll get negative one, which is pretty useful, right? So it doesn't work very well if you only have one repetition because what happens is that when you're sliding this along itself, right? Um, sometimes you'll have, um, um, you know, half of one sequence just cross correlated with zero because it's hanging off. All right, well, let me let me try to demonstrate this. All right, so say we have our sequence here. All right, this will be one minus one, blah 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 blah, or be one 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 minus one, and so on. You get the picture, All right? So when they line up and you multiply and add. You get your maximum, right? And that's what we want. But in positions where they don't line up, so like if you're over here, then you know you, you'll have this section here, which you know you multiply together and you add. We also have this section right here and there's nothing here, you just have zero. So this nice property doesn't work out over here because there's nothing to really to multiply with this uh, portion here. And that's why you see this kind of noisy looking thing over here. And you'll, you'll also see it in the uh, other image right here. So that, that's what that is. Um, however, um, so this right plot is, so I, I repeated this sequence three times and then cross correlated it with uh, a single iteration of the sequence. And you know, if you ignore the outer edges, then you get peaks whenever it lines up with one of the three iterations and you get minus one everywhere else. So that's nice. Um, you that come means up with the sequence, or is that just a well-known fifteen-bit sequence, or that has that property? Oh, uh, this. Um, I found this on Stack Exchange. <laughs> uh -huh. I mean, it's pretty cool that it has that property. Right. It, so yeah, it's not unique or anything. Um, th there's a there's a few different methods of coming up with these. And I don't know if I'm off, I don't know them offhand, uh, but I mean, it, you know, if you, if you work it out, it's it's pretty nifty. <laughs> so you'll you'll always get minus one if they're not lined up. So are the outer so there's three peaks there. Are the outer two like uh? Okay, I, I think I see what it is now. Yeah. Never mind. Okay. So of course we wanna see this in action, right? So what I did here is I um, sent 200 symbols along our, our channel, right? And I, I took, you know, this sequence repeated it three times and stuck it at the front uh, of this packet. And there's no noise in this simulation, right? Everything's flat if there's no signal. And when we do the cross correlation with that known sequence, then you see this, uh, those three peaks pop out pretty prominently. And everywhere else is you know, like less than half of those peaks. And of course, when we're outside of the packet, you get zero, which is to be expected. 
Um, so that, that's kind of cool, right? That that lets us know exactly um, where those peak, where, where where that packet starts essentially. Um, you'll notice that this is at this occurs at time two, or time two times ten to the fourth, I guess, and the packet ends at time two. Uh, that's because I accidentally swapped the order of the cross correlation when I did this. Um, if you were to swap it, then these peaks would appear on the other side and everything would make sense. Uh, so that's just my mistake. <laughs> okay, so now the question is, what if we add noise? And here's what happens. So this is a huge amount of noise. Um, and if you were to look at the constellation diagram for this, it would be pretty nasty looking. But you can see that these, uh, those three peaks still pop out pretty nicely, even though the rest of it is a little more noisy than before. And so th this is kind of a con this is a concept called, or it's it's related to a concept called processing gain. So with processing gain, the idea is that um, if you convolve what you're transmitting before you transmit it with a known sequence or code, essentially. And then you reconvolve it with that known sequence at the receiver. Even in the presence of noise, um, you'll essentially bring out your signal from the noise. And so this is a technique that was used in, uh, I think it was used in 3G communications back in the day and still is used. Um, but it's, it's a way of increasing your signal to noise ratio um, above the, what, what, we, what you'd normally get. But anyway, that's something extra to what we're doing. All right, so that looks nice. Now there are some problems here, of course. So what if there is a frequency offset before we do the cross correlation, which is inevitably the case, right? Well, it doesn't work so well anymore. <laughs> so as you can see in that top right image here, uh, there are no longer three nice peaks. Um, so it doesn't let you know exactly where the packet starts anymore. So there's some ways around this, some are more complicated than others. The lesser complicated way, uh, you can use the cross correlation to get an idea of where the packet is in time. And so you can see during the packet time, the cross correlation has an average level that's far above the noise level or the no signal level. And so that lets you, lets you know roughly where the packet is, not exactly where it starts. And then once you roughly know where the packet is, you can do that uh, frequency estimation technique that we talked about last lecture. You know, you square the signal, you take the f of t, and that'll tell you uh, where the carrier frequency is. Um, and once you do that, you can correct for the carrier frequency offset you can redo this cross correlation and you can pinpoint more precisely where the packet starts. Okay. Now the other question is what if there's a phase offset in addition to the frequency offset? And if you uh, take a look at it and you actually try doing this, you'll find out that this is not actually a problem. So if there is indeed a phase offset, that means that instead of you know, your two constellation points being on minus one and one, they'll be rotated somewhat. And that means that some of your signal will get leak, will leak into the Q channel uh, instead of the I channel where it should be. And, but once you do the cross correlation with the complex baseband signal where you combine both I and Q, uh, those three peaks will still pop out uh, without any problem. Okay. Right, so th this is a much shorter lecture than usual. 
Um, so that, that's the main topic we're covering here. So last lecture, I said I'd post assignment six, and then I never did that. Um, so I'll do that. <laughs> and then we have assignment 6.5 which is basically implementing some of this packet detection stuff, which I think will be kind of fun. Um, there's a function in MATLAB called XCORR, which stands for cross-correlate. And that makes cross-correlation really easy to do. Um, you could also think of cross-correlation like an FIR filter, right? Because, um, Remember that a convolution is essentially a filter, right? You have your impulse response, and you have um, uh, you have your input signal, right? Well, if you think of the cross correlation like a convolution, your impulse response now is the um, uh, known sequence of bits, and the signal you're inputting is the receive signal. So you can think of cross-correlation like a FIR filter, except you have to flip the order of the known sequence because when, when you do a convolution, remember you do the flip and drag. But if you don't want the flip, you got to flip again. So that, that's essentially the way of thinking about it. Um, if you've taken 132A, then you might have read, or you know, you, you probably, have learned about the optimal detector where you take the, the basis functions that represent that span your uh, your symbols, you flip the basis functions in time, and you convolve those flipped basis functions with your received signal in order to detect your symbols. Well, that, that's essentially a cross correlation, right? That, that's all it's doing. So it's the same sort of idea here. Uh, that's exactly what, a way to think about it. All right, so that's all I got. So unless there's any questions, we can call it a day. Questions, questions, no questions. Okay.